The challenge of our time, Federer and Rafael, is how to be decisive in the face of uncertainty. Now, I'm personally, by temperament, I'm at ease with ambiguity and with uncertainty. I sometimes even enjoy it. But the last couple of years, I feel like the guy having a whiskey in the Titanic and saying, I know I asked for ice, but this is a little bit too much. Uh, but, but the jokes is like, the, the last couple of years, I'm listening to Tal, I mean, they, they took a toll on my psychological well-being. It's not really depression, it's sort of a shell shock. It's sort of, I don't know you, but I'm like crouching all the time, healthy, you know, waiting for the next blow to come. It's one thing after the other. And now, as we hopefully come out of the pandemic, we want to have our innocence restored. We want to believe in a kind of permanence to our life. But that's gone for good. Plagues, wars, natural disasters, those were things that happened to other people in other times. As my son said, these were things that happened in black and white. Alas, they don't. The shock of the pandemic wasn't so much about recognizing our own mortality, but about recognizing the fragility of our lives and of our societies. Is, is this notion of it being hard to be optimistic, to expect something good? And that feeling, of course, was compounded by the brutal invasion of the Ukraine, and that state of permanent alertness is exhausting. And that's why one of the dominant feelings of the pandemic was this idea of languishing, of feeling blocked all the time. And another feeling of, uh, another thing, sorry, of the pandemic was the strain it put on relationships. Now, some relationships suffered because of distance, and some from it, and some relationships suffered because of the lack of this. <laughs> so, some became less functional, and other became recalibrated. Now, relationships were challenged at the individual level, but if you look at the Jewish people as a whole, the basic relationships that make up who we are as a people were also challenged. Because to be Jewish involved being part of three simultaneous relationships. A relationship with each other, with our fellow Jews. A relationship with the outside world. And a relationship with Judaism. On these three key relationships, we have a crisis in our hands of potentially devastating consequences. To be sure, the pandemic did not create those crises, but it's exacerbated and given a dramatic urgency that we need to recognize. So let's look at the three of them. One, in terms of our relationship with each other, with our fellow Jews, we are living in times of extreme polarization and extremism. This is not new to any of you. Now, the Jewish people was always fractious. Right? We were always divided. But the demonization level that we have today is unprecedented. The utter incapacity of having civil conversation is destroying the fabric of the Jewish community, but also driving people away from Judaism altogether. We are splintering into groups that have very little in common with each other. In the past, we used to have a commonality of faith. We felt in our gut that what happened to one of us happened to all. Not anymore. We used to have dreams and aspirations that were collective. Now, the dreams of ones are the nightmares of others. The strain in the relationship between Israel and the diaspora existed before the pandemic. But now we added the, the fact that for two years we had very little physical contact with one another. Now, how symptomatic of the fragility of the relation that for a few months we can be birthright and we tremble. Like for 2,000 years we were totally fine keeping a big tied to the land of Israel. Few months without perfect and we travel. At the local level of in, in North America, we are failing at building an inclusive community. Big chunks of our community, Jews of color, Mizrahi Jews, Haredim, Russian speaking Jews, they are underrepresented 
and often patronized in the so-called mainstream institution. In some, we don't have a Jewish public square. It is true that this is, only a, this is not only a Jewish problem. It's a general one. You know, social media, the fragmentation of the society. But we have made the problem worse by feeding the conversation to the extreme. When I say the statistics, I'm both hopeful and infuriated. I'm hopeful because when you look at the surveys, there's only 10% of people on the left and 10% of people on the right that really hold extreme, you know, ex exclusionary positions. But it's infuriating because that 20% dominates the conversation. So, if we're going to rebuild the relationship of truth with one another, we need to build a coalition of the same. The 80% between the extreme needs to reclaim the conversation. And for that, it's critical that we learn to listen to each other for that idea in a very different way. The second relationship in which we have to invest is the relation with the other. And in that realm, the resurgence of anti Semitism has made the relation with the outside world, for the first time since World War II, one of fear and mistrust. And we may be tired, exhausted, and motivated, but the anti-Semites are not. They have tons of energy, and they are inventing ever new ways of attacking us, demonizing Jews, and Israel. And let's face it, our track record in fighting anti-Semitism is not stellar. Now, I'm, for, I'm the first to say that we can't really eliminate anti-Semitism. It's been with us forever, and it's going to be for us for a long time. But the, even what we can achieve, we fail to attain. And that's because, regardless of where we stand politically, we look at anti-Semitism through a lens of ideological rigidity. We're more interested in being right than in being successful. We can and we don't resist the temptation of instrumentalizing anti-Semitism to serve our political agendas, and sometimes suddenly to attack other Jews. The truth is that that whole debate about left and right anti-Semitism is terrible, because at the core, they are one and the same. Both of them believe that the Jews have too much power, both of them believe that Jews control the world, and both of them believe that the world would be a better place without Jews. We're also totally perplexed about how to fight anti-Semitism on social media. Sometimes we think that posting on social media is like buying a full-page ad in the New York Times. It's not just the messaging that we don't know. We don't really know how the dynamics of influence work on social media. And because of that, we have been preaching to the choir into an art form. Now, if we talk about relationships, we also have become worse at building bridges and coalition with others. Again, part of that is the pandemic, but part of that is that we became ideologically rigid and we imposed all sorts of litmus tests on our wealthy partners. And it's very hard to build coalitions when we're not empathetic to the needs of others. The third relationship is that between Jews and Judaism, and that's also in crisis. Again, it's been in crisis for a long, long time. But now it's worse because after every pandemic in history, there has been a monumental quest for meaning. People look for answers. People look for meaning. And if we don't provide ways to Judaism that make it relevant, compelling, and accessible, Jews will look for meaning elsewhere. North America is the safest and richest and most powerful Jewish community in Jewish history. And yet, one of the most Jewishly illiterate. We keep creating shortcuts, gateways to nothing, all paltry substitutes for deep and, mean and meaningful engagement with our tradition. How is it, I ask myself, that poor communities in Eastern Europe and North Africa had no problem ensuring Jewish education for all their members and we can't make day school or, summer, or, or Jewish summer camp available, eh, eh, affordable, sorry. We are very, and probably that because we've been very good at creating frameworks for Jewish life, 
But we haven't been that good at adding content to those frameworks. When it comes to should I tell, to use a term in code, we've been inoculated. In other words, we receive small doses of it that prevent us from catching the real thing. So I've written about an aspirational goal of providing you know, universal Jewish literacy within a generation. It may be a terrible idea. It may be not feasible. But the point remains, we can't keep talking about Jewish engagement without talking about what we are engaging with. It was a priority before, and it's even a bigger priority now. And let me add a fourth set of relationships that is in crisis now. That is the relationship that Jews have with Jewish organizations. The pandemic made more evident that there are deep cracks in our organizational models, that they are not in line with the needs of the 21st century. Let me tell you something that will illustrate what I mean. The biggest water distribution network in Europe is owned by the Italian railroad system. Now, they own it, they don't use it, but they own it and maintain it. Why do you think that is? Why would they need water? Any idea? Right, it's from when the trains run on steam. So they needed water for the engines. Now, trains haven't run on steam for more than 50 years, but they still have that water system. So the pandemic exposed the Italian railroad water system that we all have in our organizations. The things that are relics of a different time and don't serve us anymore, rather than drag us down and they prevent us from operating in the 21st century power. Now, I know because we averted the worst and organizations didn't fall in a domino effect during COVID, we think that we'll go back to normal, but the pre-pandemic normal wasn't that normal. It was full of hope. Think, for example, about the membership model that many organizations depend on. It was broken before. Are we having any meaningful conversation about how to change it or how to renew it? Let, let's think about leadership paradigm. Are we changing our leadership models in any meaningful way, or do we still believe in the big, in the strong man paradigm and the pyramidal organization in a world that has become much more collaborative and networked? Have we invested in serious thinking on how to introduce technology, how to use technology in a meaningful way that is not simply using Zoom, but articulating the virtual with the person? Now, if all this sounds daunting, it's because it is. And yet, despite our fatigue, despite everything, we're here. Like cicadas emerging out of the ground after a long time for nation, we're here, reconnecting after breaking our fears and anxieties together again in person. We're here, hoping that this spring, finally, will bring renewal and rebirth. And we need to hold on to that feeling. Because we're going to need all the energy and all the optimism in the world to tackle the challenges that we face. The next couple of days, as Jeff mentioned, we're going to expand on all these themes. But I think that beyond that, each of us need to embark on an internal journey. One in which we re-examine our own leadership and deploy the skills and attitudes that we will need in the critical months and years ahead. Now, to finish, I would suggest two such attitudes. One is intellectual humility. You see, in the aftermath of the Spanish flu, the world was like ours. You know, uncertainty, war, and people felt as shell-shocked as we do. Not though Werner Heidenberg, who embraced that uncertainty and created or discovered precisely the uncertainty principle. The idea that we can't really know. And that ushered a way of deep intellectual humility, where people were freer to explore the world in an undogmatic way. And that probably was the key to the major scientific advancements that we had in the, 20, in the 20th century. Today, however, most of our conversations are just collisions of competing dogmatism. In fact, 
The basic fault lines today are not between people of different beliefs, but between people that hold these beliefs with a degree of uncertainty and the people who hold these beliefs with a pretense of certitude. And only through intellectual humility we can have the difficult conversation that we need to have. Only by knowing that we don't know all the answers, we can build spaces for cognitive diversity that don't stifle but embrace dissent. Only through intellectual humility we can build and maintain partnerships and coalitions that can propose creative solutions for the problems we face. Only through intellectual humility we can leave space for the other and be open to the uniqueness that only the different can bring. Only through humility we can learn and grow as persons and as a community. Secondly, we need boldness. There is indeed a time for small steps, for incremental approaches, but now is not that time. As Danton said during the French Revolution, in times of crisis, one needs boldness, more boldness, always boldness. You see, Jeff and Ronnie sometimes will hold the mirror to the philanthropic community, and I can tell you in that capacity that the pandemic was our finest hour. The philanthropic community stepped up and literally saved many organizations from ruin. But we also fell short because we failed to dream big, to use the pandemic as a moment to reimagine the community and make bold, bold philanthropic bets. And we need to ask ourselves a hard question. Are we willing to push ourselves to be bolder? Are we willing to give more boldly, to have big transformational dreams? Are we willing to reject the path of less resistance? to challenge conventional wisdom? Are we willing to go against the grain? Are we willing to lead our grandkids by example? Are we willing to create cultures that incentivize rather than penalize risk? So, to be bold in, time, in times of uncertainty is not easy. People are scared, and rightfully so, but if President Zelensky is teaching something to the world, is that leadership is helping terrified people be brave, especially when you're terrified yourself. And by the way, that's also in the Torah. The, the phrase that God tells most to Moshe is al tirat, don't be afraid. God knows it's not easy, but God also knows that we can only advance if we risk more than others think it's safe, love more than others think it's wise, Dream more than others think is practical and expect more than others think is possible. These two qualities, humility and boldness, may seem contradictory, but they are not. They are mutually necessary. Boldness without humility is arrogance. Humility without boldness is cowardice. So now is the time to challenge our limits instead of limiting our challenge. Each of us can make, can make a huge difference, and together we can make the most ambitious dreams come true. For all our problems, despite our fragility, the Jewish people is now stronger than ever in our history. If other generations didn't lower their arms in face of problems that were infinitely worse than ours, we don't have the luxury to give up. So yes, we may be exhausted and demotivated, but we're here. We're here to repair those relations and build new ones. To relearn the art of being a people. To get energized, to share our dreams, to discover that not only viruses, but good ways like compassion, passion, energy, are also contagious. Yes, these last couple of years and these last months took a heavy toll. But to paraphrase the closing of Jim Joyce's Ulysses, Though much is taken, much abides. We are still that strength which in old days moved heaven and earth. One equal temper of heroic heart, that which we are, we are. Maybe weakened by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and never to yield. Thank you.